The mythicism versus historicity debate is peripheral to mainstream scholarship and consequently receives little scholastic attention. But there are issues within mainstream scholarship that do bear on the debate and first among these is the matter of Q. Q falls within the remit of the synoptic problem. A synopsis in New Testament studies is a table where each of the four Gospels have their own columns and the rows are arranged so that entries in the four Gospels that discuss the same things appear in the same row so they can be read together and compared. A cursory glance at such a synopsis explains why the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke are known as the Synoptic Gospels and John is separate. The Synoptic Gospels share many pericopes and these appear often in very similar or even identical wording. This means that there must have been some copying going on. Either the evangelists were copying each other, or they were copying common sources. The synoptic problem is perhaps misnamed, as it is not so much a problem as a puzzle. But the term is so entrenched in scholarship that we cannot change it. The problem is working out who copied who. Many textual relationships are used to address this problem, but the one that started scholars on cue is the matter of triple and double traditions. Triple traditions are pericopes that appear in all three synoptic gospels. Double traditions refer not simply to pericopes that appear in two of the synoptic gospels, but specifically to those that appear in Matthew and Luke and not in Mark. Many hypotheses to solve the synoptic problem have been advanced, but a large majority of scholars subscribe to one of four. The most commonly held view is the two-source hypothesis, which holds that Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke were written independently of each other, but both copied Mark and another source called Q, which is short for the German word Kel meaning source. And Q contained, in essence, the double tradition material i.e. that common to Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. The two-gospel, as opposed to two-source hypothesis, holds that Matthew was written first, then Luke used Matthew, and Mark was written third using both Luke and Matthew. The Farah hypothesis holds that Mark was written first, followed by Matthew, who used Mark, and then Luke, who used both Matthew and Mark. The oral tradition hypothesis is the fourth one, and it holds that much of the commonality between the Gospels is based on them using the same oral traditions rather than relying on each other or external written sources. The two-source hypothesis was first proposed in 1838. It has been the subject of prolonged and intensive scholarly attention. It is by no means the unanimous opinion of scholars, but does remain the majority view. Despite this lack of consensus, the study of Q has become a scholastic discipline in its own right. Scholars in the field have reconstructed Q from the double tradition material, have analysed it in detail and have identified chronological layers of its development. Q supports historicity. Within the mythicism versus historicity debate, the most obvious reason for believing this is that mythicists almost universally reject the two-source hypothesis and Q. Back in the mainstream, there are several reasons why Q supports historicity. One is that if the hypothesis is true, then it makes it difficult to argue that historicization began with Mark, because Matthew and Luke had access to a source that locates Jesus on earth and that was independent of Mark. Another is that the content of Q argues for historicity. If Q is true, then its dissection into chronological layers by Mac and others does seem to be reasonable and that chronology mirrors the historicist rather than the mythicist position because its earliest layer has Jesus as a sage kicking off a movement similar to the cynic school of Greek philosophy. Then later layers ascribe first miracle working and then divinity to Jesus, reflecting the same progression of belief of regular human to human with supernatural powers to God-man as is proposed by historicists. The oldest layer of Q, called Q1, contains the opening lines of the Beatitudes, Love your enemies and bless those who curse you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other cheek. If someone steals your coat, give them your shirt as well. Do not judge or you will be judged. Can the blind lead the blind? How can you look at the splinter in your brother's eye without noticing the plank in your own? And a limited version of the Lord's Prayer.
It also contains the line about the lilies of the valley who don't work or spin, but even Solomon's splendour was not as magnificent, along with other sayings attributed to Jesus. There are also a couple of parables. The rich man who built larger barns for his great harvest, and the man who held a banquet to which the invited guest did not turn up, so he extended the invitation to all comers. There is minimal narrative content in Q1. There is reference to God the Father, but no indication that Jesus had a unique relationship with him, and neither are there any supernatural acts. Q2 contains the miracle of the healing of the centurion's servant by remote control. There is also reference to miracles by instructing John's disciples to go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind recover their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the dead are raised. Q3 contains the temptations of Jesus, the statement that those who follow Jesus will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and the assertions that those in Jerusalem will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and authority over the world has been given to me by my Father. Another reason why Q supports historicity is that it provides a counter to the silence of Paul argument for mythicism. The argument that kicked off the mythicist position, and which remains one of its strongest. This is because the earliest layer of Q shows us a religion, or rather a philosophy, that is widely divergent from Paul's. It is focused on lifestyle and behaviour rather than faith and redemption. If Q is true and it does reflect the earliest Galilean Christian community, then it had very little in common with Paul's religion. There are many teachings of Jesus in the Gospels as a whole which Paul would have found useful in propounding his thesis, but in Q1, which the theory holds was the element of Jesus' teaching that was possibly contemporary with Paul, there is very little you would expect him to have used. There are, of course, counters to the argument from Q. For one thing, the two-source hypothesis which involves Q may be a majority view among scholars, but by no means has it attracted what could be called a consensus. There are many dissenting voices, with good reason for their dissent. Another objection is that the dissection of Q into three chronological layers is primarily dependent on style and content. Q1 is in essence a collection of aphorisms and instructions to Jesus' individual followers. In Q2, the style is one of an authoritative prophet making pronouncements to them and to the whole world. The Q3 layer contains the smallest amount of content, limiting stylistic analysis, and one reason for identifying it as a separate strata is that it introduces the idea of Jesus as the Son of God. Another issue concerns the chronology of the three layers. There are many cases in which Q2 comments follow on from the immediately preceding Q1 comments, enabling us to say that the Q2 content was added later. While this also can be argued for Q3 versus Q2, it is less obvious, and therefore one of the reasons for placing Q3 as the latest is again that it introduces the idea of Jesus as a God. There is therefore a minor circularity in using Q to justify historicity. That is, that the historicity progression of man to superman to godman contributed to the analysis which led to the conclusion that Q gives a history of progression from man to superman to godman. However, this is a relatively minor problem because the distinction between Q1 and Q2 is readily justified without reference to this assumption and the later edition of Q3 can be justified without reference to it. The reconstruction and analysis of Q have consumed tens of thousands of scholar hours employing modern methods of criticism, and as such, individuals without extensive experience of the topic cannot really compete with their analysis. That means there is a large component of argument from authority in the argument from Q, a feature I have already flagged as concerning. And almost all of the scholarly community involved in Q are and have been minimal historicists. Christian apologists reject Q because of the purely secular nature of the scholarship on which it is based. Specifically, the assumption that text common to more than one gospel must mean that somebody was copying somebody else is rejected in favour of the idea that divine inspiration led to the same wording appearing. Mythicists also reject Q, and in many cases this is clearly because it does not support their position – 
However, this is not universally the case. As we've seen from the issue of Q3, the mythicist position itself to some extent undermines Q. Therefore, it would be perfectly reasonable for a mythicist to examine the evidence and conclude that, if mythicism is correct, then Q is unlikely, rather than simply observing the effect of Q and to reject it because it does not support their position. Notable in this regard is the prominent mythicist Robert M. Price, who has proposed an intriguing solution to the synoptic problem. That is that Marcion, who composed the first New Testament canon that we are aware of, or his followers, wrote what we now know as the Gospel of Luke, which they referred to as their Gospel of the Lord. Marcion was a Gnostic and saw the God of the Old Testament as a flawed, inferior God, not relevant to Christians who worship a superior God. The Gospel of Matthew is replete with parallels between Jesus and Old Testament figures, and this could explain why much of it was either discarded or heavily edited in the writing of Luke. It's interesting that Price's hypothesis also works for the two-source hypothesis. If the writer of Luke had access to all three of Matthew, Mark and Q, then rejection of much of Matthew and reliance on Q for those areas where Q and Matthew overlap is explained. Within mainstream scholarship there are several arguments levelled against the two-source hypothesis and hence Q. The Farrar hypothesis maintains Markian priority, but argues that Luke copied material in the double tradition directly from Matthew, rather than that both copied from a third source. This is basically a simpler hypothesis than Q, and so one favoured by Occam's razor. Then there is the matter of minor agreements. These concern material in the triple tradition, i.e. that which is found in all three synoptic gospels, rather than the Q material, which is found in Matthew and Luke only. In this triple tradition material, there are a number of instances. In fact, it has been counted as 347 instances by Nerick, where one or more words have been added to Mark's text, and where both Matthew and Luke agree against Mark. This implies that Luke had access to Matthew, thus undermining one of the main contentions of the two-source hypothesis, which is that Matthew and Luke were written independently of each other. If so, then the obvious conclusion is that Luke simply copied the Q material directly from Matthew, possibly editing and revising it to be friendly to Marcionites as suggested by Price. This would be a stronger argument if we were confident that the Gospels we currently have reflect their original wording. But we are not confident of that. Specifically, the versions we have came down to us through a process of multiple copying and presumably editing by scribes who, at least in some cases, probably had access to both Matthew and Luke. Also, these hypotheses that Luke used Matthew leave open the question of where Matthew got his non-Markian material from. Asserting that Matthew simply made it up fails to explain how Q appears to naturally fall into chronological layers. In other words, historically, Q was discovered as a consequence of the two-source hypothesis, but more recent scholarship has identified credible reasons for believing in its existence, whether or not the two-source hypothesis is correct. Finally, and perhaps most damning, is the fact that this apparently highly prized and crucial document of early Christianity has neither survived, nor has any reference to a document that sounds like it, survived in the writings of early Christians. This criticism was partly blunted by the discovery of the Gospel of Thomas in the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945. The Gospel of Thomas is a list of sayings, and this argues that sayings Gospels like Q were used by early Christians. While it's true that Q as currently reconstructed is not purely a list of sayings but also has some narrative content, the earliest layer of Q, Q1, is pretty much a list of sayings. So in the end, the issues surrounding Q, to my mind, do favour historicity. Even if Q was not a single document, and the two-source hypothesis does not require that it was, it could have been multiple documents with possibly a component of oral tradition, there is still a discernible progression from sage to miracle worker to God-man that can be extracted from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. There is, of course, the issue of argument from authority, but in this case, perhaps... Just perhaps, the authorities do have good reason for their positions.